Really, I want to thank Brian Callahan again and the, all the riders from Sun Valley. I think it made a huge difference today having those guys showing us around, especially on a powder day like that. It was amazing. <laughs> Saved us some time. Got into more, less, less mashed potatoes, more powder turns, which is good. You guys have good spots. Um, all right, so last night, again, I know a few people came in late. I'm glad everyone at least got to eat. We all got here, threw some bowling balls around, got out to ride. Um, one other thing, if you didn't know yet, check your workbooks. See if you have your USB drive. If you got your golden ticket, has a winner come forward yet to claim the SIA $3,000 worth of research? Does anyone know? You do have to put your USB drive in, and then you will know if you won. So it's worth checking it out. It's not, it's not a physical ticket. It has to do, it's on, and everyone's scrambling to get their, get their stuff together. Um, so anyway, check that out at, at your leisure <laughs> when you can. All right, so today, we said last night, uh, because of the travel changes, we did push uh, Steve Lake to, to today, which is fine. We still have a lot of, lot of great presentations. We're going to work in uh, a couple breaks here and there, and I think it's going to be a good mix between panel discussions, presentations, and roundtables. Um, I think just because of the timing, we'll just go ahead and, and jump right into it. I think you should all take a minute in your workbook and check out Steve Lake's bio. Because any bio that begins with, I was born a poor white child from Southern California, more than likely I'll die a crusty, grumpy old man from some mountain hideaway is definitely worth reading. It's pretty divine. But I will uh, also add that, you know, we work with Steve in Section 9 a lot at Transworld Business and uh, all our titles. And we always thought that they were just a great example of, of a company that stayed very true to their vision from the beginning and we weren't afraid to take, you know, a little criticism knowing that they had a long-term plan in place and they're gonna make it work and so it's very cool to see that company come from actually embarrassingly we can admit from at one point not even being allowed to advertise in Transworld skateboarding to now being the toast of the IAS skateboarding conference and being lavish with praise and all that so I think really a, a great a great story here and I'm really proud to welcome Steve Lake up to the stage now All right, so this is part therapy for me because it's my first uh, public speaking event. So either my uh, knees are really shaky or it's just from snowboarding. So I'm hoping it's just from snowboarding. Here's my, my handy flipper. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd start this off since we did so much travel to get here on our plane and then on the bus. It's amazing the things that go through your mind on the bus when you think you're coming in here to, uh, to talk. So we're on the plane, and we take off, and we get up to about the 30,000-foot level, and the pilot comes on and says, uh, okay, everybody, we've reached our cruising altitude. It's now safe to uh, walk about the cabin. And right when he finished saying that, you heard him go, oh, shit. And there's just silence. <laughs> and I'm sitting next to this little old lady who's, Starting to freak out. I'm kind of freaking out, but trying to maintain my composure, kind of like I'm doing right now. And um, I'm like, it's going to be okay. You know, the plane's not doing anything weird. We're going to be fine. And the guy comes back on the, uh, on the loudspeaker and says, uh, you know, about two minutes later, sorry, folks. Um, but right, right when I was talking to you all, the, uh, the stewardess came in with a cup of coffee and tripped and spilt it all over my lap. And so he says, uh, I, I wish all of you could see the, the front of my pants right now. And the little old lady sitting next to me says, the front of his pants, I wish you guys could all see the back of my pants. <laughs> so I, I thought it was pretty freaking funny. So my name's Steve Lake. I'm the, uh, the president and co-founder of Sector 9. Uh, thanks for letting me be here. Uh, again, bear with me as I walk through my public speaking debut. Um, I like coming to these industry events because you, I mean, I've gone to like the, uh, the SEMA events, the IASC events, and it's my first time coming to a uh, snow conference, but it's always cool to come to these because you get a lot of people together that kind of share the same passion and everyone's here for, for the right reasons. Either that or, you know, half the people are here because they just want to go riding and this is kind of the smoke screen to let the, uh, the company pay for it. That's part of the reason I'm here. So my goal tonight is to share with you um, some of the lessons I've learned along the way with Sector 9 for the past 18 years. That and, uh, you know, I really love snowboarding. 
I, uh, I first stepped on skis when I was four years old, which is quite a while ago. And I've, uh, I've been on the mountain at least once, but usually multiple times I try to hit double digits as often as possible, every year since. And uh, there's something about the, mo the mountains that, uh, that's why I say I want to die the, the crusty old man from some mountain hideaway, because personally I feel more alive when I'm in the mountains than just about anywhere in, on earth. I mean, I love, I love surfing, I love skateboarding. Uh, surfing's kind of a selfish sport. You know, I mean, you can paddle out with your best buddy and just about the time you get outside, he looks at you like he's never seen you before and paddles around you and snakes you on the next wave. And snowboarding, it's fun to come and, you know, days like today where you can watch your, watch your buddy drop in and, you know, get the first turns and just kind of do some figure eights behind him. Everything from being sandblasted by the, the ice coming over the, the top of, uh, of a mountain to the, uh, that quiet thumping that you get in your heart when you're... Uh, when you eat it in the trees and you're all alone and all your, all your boys have taken off. When the guys from Transworld asked me to come here, again, I was pretty apprehensive um, for a number of reasons, but none less than me being up here right now. Uh, they had asked me, and I, I, I think I gave a uh, serious maybe, <laughs> I think is how I put it. And I figure this is one of those points in my life, either I just need to step up or just shut up. So I'm, I'm stepping up. But right after they asked, I, I kind of drug Adam out for a, a solid month at least. Uh, I was snowboarding. And I looked up, and floating above me was, was that snowboard. And I thought, you know, something kind of rang a bell, and I was thinking, what the, what is it? Why, why does that all of a sudden make me uh, feel like I should be doing something different? So, it, it brought me back to a point where I realized how much snowboarding had really changed my life. I mean, if it weren't for snowboarding, I, I definitely wouldn't be here today. Um, snowboarding really did send my life Definitely down the path less traveled. I mean, Rob talked about a couple of the challenges we had in the beginning, and there's quite a few more, but uh, I don't know that I'll get into those yet. But, you know, it was one of those pivotal times where I had to make that choice of, do personally, do I follow my dreams and go against the grain, or do I do as my parents suggested and go get a real job? You know, thankfully, uh, I didn't listen to my parents. Something else I realize is, you know, I, I hate thieves. Um, by the way, this is, this is Steve Clausen, circa, circa 1996, writing a board that, uh, that we made out of a thousand square foot, our first building in Serena Valley. Um, back to thieves. I freaking hate them. There's just something incredibly violating about having something stolen from you. Uh, we live in, in coastal San Diego, so we've had... I mean, I've had surfboards stolen out of the back of my truck. I've had skateboards stolen. We have uh, somebody tried to steal our family suburban like five days before Christmas. Somebody else actually stole our family suburban. Uh, left my wife and kids at the mall. Uh, somebody once stole my truck with my dog in the back. They kidnapped my dog for like probably six or seven hours. Yeah, <laughs> what a watchdog, huh? <laughs> The guy just laid back there and slept. Luckily, we got the dog back and the car. But the, the point with the, the thieves is, although they're, it's incredibly violating and I absolutely despise them being the president of a skateboard company, clearly I've had a handful of theft issues that I've had to deal with in my time. Um, one thief changed, changed my life, the life of uh, a number of people very, very close to me. And quite frankly, you know, uh, possibly the, the history of skateboarding today because he, uh, he, stole a, he, stole a, he stole this board. This is actually a replica. This is the, ben the benefit of eBay, although I, it's a love-hate relationship because uh, I'm not a big fan of eBay when it comes to people selling our products online. But uh, this, this snowboard right here, it's a replica. My business partner, one of my very best friends, 
uh, he's a surfboard shaper, uh, super cool guy, uh, was up in Tahoe with a buddy of his. Somebody gave him this old Sim switchblade. He took it back. It was kind of delaminating. delaminating. He uh, cut it into a shape similar to this, put some trucks and wheels on it. It was bombing the, uh, the hills of La Jolla, and we'd always skate down to our, the place where we where we live. We live in La Jolla, so we, we'd skate down and surf South Bird. And we'd always stash our, our skateboards in the same spot. And this was the board he was always riding. Uh, the rest of us were riding just regular, you know, more transition boards. We just built a mini ramp in the backyard. And anyway, we got all the water, and somebody had stolen this board right here. And another reason I'm here, because I thought the irony of it, when I found out that that was a Sims board, I went online and I realized that Sims had re-released the same graphics that was on the skateboard that was originally stolen when we were surfing. So that's probably why I'm here more than anything, because the irony there was, was too much for me to pass up. And so there's, there's the original one. There's today's model. So someone steals the board. We come out. We're bummed. And, you know, Dennis is a pretty, pretty mellow guy, pretty level-headed. He, instead of coming back and doing what the rest of us did, which was just bitch and complain, he was shaping surfboards. He went into the backyard and took a uh, piece of plywood that was left over from the mini ramp we had just built, made a template, like a surfboard shaper can, because I sure can't, and cut out the original teardrop shape, which is similar to what Steve Clausen's writing right up there. He fiberglassed it. He put some big trucks and wheels on it. He actually went to the swap meet and bought some big trucks and wheels because in 1993, uh, you couldn't find big trucks and wheels anywhere. And started, uh, started bombing the hills. The rest of us, you know, barely had jobs. Scraping by. Personally, I was waiting tables at Chili's and trying to put myself through school. My claim to fame. Uh, actually, my wife met me. I was making skateboards in the backyard and waiting, waiting tables at, at Chili's restaurant. Her dad was incredibly proud. <laughs> she was going to USA, <laughs> USC. She, he thought she was going to marry a doctor or a lawyer or something. But he met me, the guy that got drunk the night before I ever met him and shaved my head with my buddies, so I looked like a Q-tip the day the guy met me. <laughs> <laughs> so Dennis shapes this, this skateboard, and he starts bombing the hills. The rest of us scrape together what we can to, uh, to ride the, the mini ramp in the backyard. and. We were always stealing the guy's board, and eventually uh, he got so sick of myself and a couple of other guys stealing his board that he asked if we wanted help making, making boards for ourselves. Being that I have two left hands and cannot, you know, freaking draw a straight line to save my life, I raised my hand and said, yes, please, I need help. And he helped me. And so we made two more boards, one for me, one for uh, another friend of ours who, you know, like good or bad, decided that uh, what we were doing wasn't really worth pursuing, so he moved back to Hawaii. Um, everywhere we went, riding these boards in La Jolla, people would always ask us where we got them. And so when we told them that uh, we were making them in our backyard, people started asking us if we'd make them boards. And so we, you know, we thought we were uh, big business guys back then, and we started making skateboards for uh, $25 a piece in our backyard. And it was weird. It was... Uh, you know, we'd sell a board to a guy, and, you know, we'd laugh about it, and next thing you know, his friend would come over wanting a board, and then a friend's friend, and then a friend's friend's friend. And before we know it, knew it, we probably made about 200 boards in our backyard. We're like, okay, wow, that's kind of crazy. So, you know, really that pivotal time was, you know, now I just graduated college. I uh, didn't know anything about business. I graduated with a degree in psychology. Do we go... She got offered a job working for Nortel selling telephone systems in San Francisco. Do I go off and, you know, sell phone systems, which sounds like selling insurance. I just couldn't find myself doing it. Or stick around and, and keep following the dreams. So we made fake business cards, snuck into an ASR show, and walked around to see if anybody else was doing anything remotely similar to what we were doing. Nobody was. So we decided to... Uh, get business plans for dummies, and actually with a typewriter, 
we typed up a business plan and we presented it to, uh, to my parents to borrow $10,000. Uh, that seemed like a lot of money when we were asking for it, but it's not a lot of money. By the time we first, uh, by the time we got into our first trade show, we were about $2,000 in debt. And I talked a Japanese guy into prepaying for 100, for 100 boards. That's the money that uh, we used to fund the production for our first run of skateboards. We never borrowed any money, again, from anybody else besides, you know, lines of credit from the bank. And we took off and started going for it. Uh, it was not an easy, it wasn't easy in the beginning, that's for sure. Uh, we realized early on that we had no idea how to make skateboards. Uh, if the <laughs> it was pretty crude the way we were making these boards in our backyard. So when we got into the 1,000 square foot place where, we were, where that board was made, it was equally as crude. Um, that's uh, 1994. Uh, we didn't know how to make skateboards, so we decided to go and approach uh, one of the biggest skateboard manufacturers in the world at the time, uh, PS Sticks, Paul Schmidt. We went into him with our flat pentail skateboard and asked if uh, he would please make them for us because we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, he told us that uh, we might be able to pawn 100 or so off on some of our friends, but there wasn't really a market for what we were doing. So we were bummed. But uh, we left and said, okay, well, screw that guy. We're going to figure out how to do it ourselves. And that's what we did. Drove up and down the coast a number of times, going into shops, uh, trying our hardest to get them to carry our skateboards. You know, uh, got laughed out of a a lot of places that we went, me personally, because, you know, Dennis is the artsy-fartsy guy, and I was kind of the business sales guy. Uh, one good customer that I'm sure many people in this room we, we share together, in particular, bothered me, because he told me that I had a non-functional flat piece of wood that would never sell. Last year, he sold $120,000 worth of those non-functional pieces of wood and so uh, I get a good laugh every once in a while when I, when I do run into them. But it's amazing what a little confidence, you know, little pockets of success here and there. Uh, it, you start to feel like, okay, maybe, we'll, maybe we're onto something. Maybe we'll actually get it. And, you know, honestly, at that point, you really, you can't really care too much what people think. Because you know that, you know, for us at least, we had sold by that time, you know, a few hundred boards. And everybody that had one seemed pretty stoked on it. And so... A couple of judgmental people really didn't bother us that much, and plus, rarely did they say anything to our face. So, some of the lessons I've learned along the way, I promise it won't be as boring as the, uh, the speaker next door who has like <laughs> eight point font up there and a freaking novel. So, we're going to go just the opposite. I thought I was going to go just the opposite. Okay, there we go. I'm going to go for David Letterman. Instead of uh, the top ten, I'm going to go for the top nine, because after all, we are sector nine. So, one lesson I learned. Dare to be different. You know, uh, Abraham Lincoln was uh, one of our greatest leaders of all time, and you know, one of his quotes was, I destroy my enemies by making them my friend. Uh, in a world that's incredibly homogenized, where, you know, in the skateboard market at least, everything's made the same for the most part. It, it comes down to marketing. You know, we, we decided that uh, we were going to be different. We didn't, we didn't, didn't want to be the same as everybody else. You know, and it's easy for, uh, for people to come along and, and pass judgment when you're being different. But for us, again, we didn't... We didn't really care what people thought. And being so different and not caring really did allow us, with Sector 9 at least, to fly under the radar for well over a decade before anybody really knew that we were having any kind of success at all. We never stood on the rooftops and said, hey, we're killing it over here. You guys are blowing it. We just kind of went along doing our own thing. Whenever, any, whenever somebody asked how we were doing, we said, oh, we're doing all right. You know, life's good. We're still here. Um, so, 
I think of what we did, and then I think of snowboards when they came into the ski industry. And I think there's, uh, there's quite a few parallels there. Because uh, at first, people were, you weren't even allowed on the mountain. You know, you had to go hike in the backcountry to ride. You know, the, the ski resorts were like, eh, you guys are a bunch of jokers. You know, go, go skate on, the, uh, on some ob- somebody else's hill. You're not going to skate on my hill. Well, you know, that's kind of how we felt. You know, and, and much like the snowboard market, at least for us, you know, the ski market came in, and no disrespect to the ski market, but, you know, they came in and either they created their own snowboards because now they're actually selling under their own labels. They went out and acquired some other brands, uh, but they found their way to get into the snowboard market. And that th- same thing's happening right now in our market. Good or bad or indifferent, I don't really know. It's just, it's capitalism. You know, this is the American dream after all, so people can do whatever they want. For us, we knew early on we weren't trying to make skateboards for skateboarders. You know, those are, uh, you know, I mean, heck, keep in mind that we were skating our mini ramp at the time, so we're skateboarders at heart. I mean, I started skateboarding when I was just a little kid. But they're the ones that are passing judgment on us. And so, you know, fine. You want to give us the finger? We'll give you the finger. We weren't trying to make skateboards for them. We were trying to make skateboards for everybody else. So they can have their little narrow market, but we wanted everybody to have four wheels under their feet. So we looked at anybody that was riding a snowboard, that was surfing, hell, guys that are mountain biking, guys that are riding their beach cruisers, even rollerbladers. They are people too. <laughs> we had a guy come to us about six or seven years ago, and I don't know if anybody knows anything about uh, our products, but we have this one really ugly looking skateboard truck. It's got this double kingpin thing, and it's all offset, and it's ugly as sin, but functional as hell. And so, a testament to a guy that dared to be different. He came into us, you know, and again, we're skateboarders at heart and try not to be judgmental, but sometimes you can't really help it. I mean, you know, got to call it like you see it. And, you know, we we're kind of snickering a little bit and trying to do the right thing. I said to the guy, hey, you know what? It looks a little weird, but just if you want us to try it, leave one here and let us ride it for a month, and I'll give you my honest opinion. I'm, I'm big on brutal honesty, sometimes to a fault. He said, okay, and he left it with us. Within about two weeks, it was the number one board that everybody would ride to the deli every day. And we're like, wow, you know, so we started riding the thing more and more, and he, he came back, and he said, so what do you guys think? I think the thing is really ugly, man, but it rides really good. So he said, well, you know, is there anything we can do? You know, you guys, I, I don't know anything about sales or marketing, and I don't have any money. I can't manufacture anything. And I thought, you know, let's see what we can do. And so we, we actually bought the trucks from him, but he was really, he was worse at making those than we were at making skateboards in the early days. So we, we quickly got rid of that. But um, so we tried it. Today, this guy, his name is Al Williams, is <laughs> honestly probably one of the lucky, he's luckier than any of us. Because we took this thing on, and I told the guy that I'd give him, you know, I was a horrible negotiator, clearly. I told him I'd give him a certain dollar amount for every truck that we sold. Today, we have those trucks on an entire series of our products, and we sell, we sell quite a few of them. I'll just put it that way. So this guy has mailbox money coming every single month, living in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I laugh every time I sign the check. I mean, it's, you know, it's a win-win, but uh, it's the little things in life that can make big things happen, and that's, that's really the point. Okay, people don't always know what they want. I plagiarized this one from um, Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if anybody has heard of Malcolm Gladwell, but he's an amazing author. He's written books, uh, The Outliers, The Tipping Point, and Blink. Uh, if you haven't read them, you should read them. Uh, He's also an amazing speaker. He gets paid a lot of money to speak. Um, But I chose to plagiarize his work because it's true. When I I reflect back and I think about it, people don't really know what they want. Uh, You know, for the snowboard industry, although, you know, rocker boards aren't, you know, I mean, today they feel like a new phenomenon. But if you look back, I think really there was rocker and boards long before they became the marketed rocker boards that they are today. But for us, in 1993, I say 93, 1993, um, 
The skateboard market, in my opinion, thought that they wanted seven and a quarter inch boards with 129 millimeter trucks, with 49 millimeter wheels, and if you weren't skating street, you know, you were just a Barney. And that was it in the skateboard world. And, you know, here we come, a bunch of, you know, surfer dudes that, you know, didn't really look like we knew what we were doing, and we have these 48-inch pintail boards with, we begged Kryptonics to make us 70 millimeter wheels, but, you know, they were focused on the roller skate market, and they didn't think that we'd be able to sell these big 70 millimeter skateboard wheels, so they wouldn't actually make skateboard wheels for us. So we had to go and talk somebody else into doing it at the time. But so we went totally against the grain, and, and what we found out was people really didn't know what they wanted. You know, and the way we were able to help them understand what they wanted was by giving demo boards. So we walked, we went up and down the coast and gave demo boards to all kinds of shops. You know, back, you know, a demo board for us was a lot of money back then. But that was our way of getting people to try something different. And when they tried it, every once in a while, somebody would actually buy one. Then their friends would steal their boards, and they would ride it, and then they would come in and buy one. And that's kind of really how that snowball began to, uh, began to roll. And, you know, retailers didn't really know what they wanted. Retailers, just, they just want something that's going to sell. And I get that. I mean, you got employees, you got rent. Just, you know, give it to me if it's going to sell. If it's not going to sell, I don't want it. But when you walk in with this anomaly, this weird-looking board, you, know, you got to really put your game face on and try and sell it to them that, hey, you know, really, this, let's try this. And we were a firm believer we would never sell on consignment. I uh, never have, never will. I mean, I made some promises that I would buy things back if they didn't sell, but we would never sell on consignment. Um, I, I always figured if we sold on consignment, you kind of take away the retailer's incentive to want to turn their inventory. And so you you kind of lose some engagement at retail. Uh, a turning point for us in helping people uh, that didn't know what they want was when we realized that all of our boards were basically being put in the corner of a store because there was nowhere to put them. And so being the horrible manufacturers that we were, we had a lot of blemishes. And so one day I was looking at all the blemishes, just a stack about this high and that big in the corner, and I thought, you know, if we cut slots in those things, we could actually display our boards. And so we decided, you know what, let's, let's take all of these mistakes. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? So we decided to cut these up. We had a wood shop, and we made racks. We took racks into the stores and said, okay, well, that's great that you're going to carry one or two, but let's carry six. Well, let's not just carry six. Let's carry six, and let's put them right here so that everybody that walks in the store has to see them. And what we came to figure out was the more boards that we had in the store, the more interesting it was to the people that walked into the store, because they would walk in and be like, you know, what are these things? Combine that with some demo boards, you get where I'm going. It was all about giving people an alternative. Just do it. I don't know if anybody's ever been to the top of one of these things, but uh, I have. If you've ever been to the top of one of them that's outside, uh, when the wind's blowing, the thing's swaying back and forth. It, it adds a whole, whole new perspective to what these guys actually, actually do. When you're standing up top there and you're thinking about dropping in, which I would not do, that launch ramp looks like a friggin' landing strip from a uh, F-18 coming in on an aircraft carrier. But I, I see a lot of similarities in what we do, all of us here, versus what these guys do. I mean, they're athletes. You know, our jobs are to, you know, make, make products and sell them and, and run businesses. You know, these guys, they need the courage to push themselves over the edge. You know, that's how they're going to find out what they're made of in life. And I think there's a lot of similarities with us because we don't know if it's going to sell. You know, everybody, everyone's always designing things. Everyone hopes they're going to sell. I mean, but you never know until you go. I mean, you got to put it out there to see if it's going to work. And so... That's why I like this photo, and just do it has a little, a little more meaning to me. But uh, the great Marvin Hagler once said, and I, I love this one, and I promised Dennis that I would work this in somewhere. So Dennis, who's not here, who owes and ums more than I do, if you ever put a microphone in his hand, he absolutely hates it. Uh, it's hard to get out of bed at 6 a.m. to work when you're sleeping in silk pajamas. And I, I think the point there is 
the more successful you are, the more you, 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 you feel success, the harder it is to stay motivated for future success. And so, you know, we don't ever want to get comfortable, even if we have the silk pajamas. The just do it, though, in, in, 19, in the early 90s is when, uh, when I was in college. I was a horrible student. Uh, I actually flunked out of Cuesta Junior College up in San Luis Obispo. I don't know if anybody's been there, but if they have, you'll know why. I think we partied a little too much and studied a, a lot too little. But that was just about the time that Nike came out with this slogan, and I had a little epiphany moment where it was, okay, you know, remove the head from the ass or, you know, end up at McDonald's. And so that just do it, when I had my epiphany moment, there were stickers all around. I don't know if anybody remembers that, that slogan back then, but... Uh, I took that slogan and, and used it to help me stay motivated to, to get my stuff done. You know, the guys around me, everyone was, I, don't know, I won't say what they were doing, but they were, uh, they were doing all kinds of fun things. And I'd come home from school and, you know, I'd ditch off and go do my stuff and then I'd come back and join them. And so that's a mantra that really has stayed in, ingrained in my head and it's one that I really... As a leader, I try to push it on, uh, push it on the people that, uh, that work with me. As a father, I try to keep that same, um, that, those same principles into my kids. I mean, if you were to ask my kids today, you know, a couple of the, the sayings they hear most from me, it's, uh, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And uh, don't talk about it, be about it. You know, nothing bothers me more than my daughter saying, oh, I'm going to make my bed. Well, just go make it and then tell me that it's done, please. Rear view mirrors suck. I probably believe this more than anything else I'm spewing at you today. Uh, the great Wayne Gretzky said, uh, to be successful, you have to skate where the puck is going, not where it's been. And I agree. I mean, I spent the first 10 years at Sector 9, and we, we have meetings, and we sit around, and we talk about the future and everything, wondering when it was all going to end. Then I realized about eight years ago that maybe it's just beginning. You know, I mean, for us, if uh, when we look back, we think, you know, 10 years ago, we were just this anomaly that people would see every once in a while on the street, but a 10-year-old kid today doesn't know life without these longboards or these cruiser boards. Um, it's not unusual to see, uh, especially in the coastal communities, kids skateboarding with, you know, on a, on a bigger board with, Big soft wheels with a, uh, you know, a park board in their backpack. Uh, I love it when I see that. I think too many people, and I'm guilty of it, and that's what brings me to this, uh, lead their business looking backwards. You know, we look back and we think, well, we did this, this, and this, and that's what got us here today. I, I think that's a mistake. I, I think, uh, you know, if, if you're in the lead and you're going to stay in the lead, then you need to keep looking forward. I mean, race car drivers don't have big rear view mirrors. They got those things, those blockers, and they're looking straight ahead. If you're not in the lead, I think at, at every turn, we need to be looking for, uh, to set up for the pass. You just have to ask yourself questions. You know, what impact is what you're doing today? What does it have on the environment? You know, I mean, I, I cut down trees. I make skateboards. You know, so I'm sitting in the audience thinking, oh, geez, and I'm blowing it. But then we went back and thought, okay, you know, that's, wow, that's, that's profound. What impact is it having? You know, and from that, it, it, me personally, I went back and said, okay, well, my job here, if I'm supposed to lead these people, is to, to dig in deep and, you know, let me ask the questions. And so out of that came a whole understanding of, of uh, conventional cotton versus organic cotton, of um, regular forestation versus sustainable foresting. Um, and so we made, we made profound changes pretty much immediately that, and it, every time we've made those profound changes, we've only benefited from them. I mean, we've benefited the environment, and we've benefited sales. So we, we decided no more of a conventional cotton. That stuff's horrible. So everything became organic. Prices of our T-shirts went up. Sales went up. You know, uh, revenues went up. It was great. Uh, same with uh, the forestation. I mean, we didn't even know that was an, an alternative to buying maple wood. So we went out and said, okay, well, if we're going to do it, let's make sure that it is, you know, sustainably harvested. Basically, they cut down 
some of the more mature trees to make room for the m more plentiful younger trees below to grow. And it makes sense, and they plant a certain number of trees for every tree they cut down. Uh, we switched everything over to all water-based inks, all water-based solvents pretty much immediately. Uh, we, and something you guys can all do too, and I would highly recommend it, we went and, uh, I can uh, email me and I can tell you the name of the company because I'm drawing a blank because I'm standing up here in front of you guys, but we basically, went, we bought wind energy credits to offset all of the, uh, the energy we use to power our facility, both our offices, our manufacturing and everything. It's not that much additional. I mean, it costs more, but it basically you pay more money and it mandates that for us it's SDG&E to pull down a certain amount of energy to offset ours from clean energy sources. Um, we need to ask the questions. We need to make the decisions because I think failure, uh, failure to act is sometime, sometimes our biggest uh, failures of all. <coughs> Perspectives are, or yeah, perspectives are relative. You know, for me, I realize that uh, emotion at work is my worst enemy. And you know, when you're, when you're running a business that's going against the grain, there's a lot of people. There used to be not so much anymore, but there are a lot of people that talk shit. And sometimes uh, that emotion turns to anger. And I think we've we've done some stupid things as a result of that as I've matured, uh, I've realized that haters love to hate. And, and it's always easier for somebody to pass judgment on what somebody else is doing than it is to create something of their own to be judged. And so uh, I, I find a lot of, uh, I don't know, it adds a lot of perspective to me when, when I realize that. You know, for us, we live in this internet world where you have a lot of we like to call them skate nerds that sit behind their computer at home and, <laughs> and like to, to type and talk all kinds of smack about everybody else. I'm sure we have snow nerds out there too. I'm uh, just not so, you know, well-versed in the snow nerds. But, you know, let the haters hate. That's really, that's really it. A little perspective for Sector 9. You know, when we started in 93, 94, the World Wide Web didn't really exist. Uh, we, as a means to an end, had to, uh, well, we didn't have to. We decided early on that, you know, it was hard to get our product in front of people's eyes that were outside of mainly the coastal communities and a couple of uh, mountain communities. So we were actually in the first 25,000 websites ever on the World Wide Web. And today there's literally hundreds of millions of them. Uh, social networking the impact that's having on all of our businesses. If, uh, if you don't have or you're not focused on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all these other social networking uh, avenues, uh, I think you're blowing it. I think you should really look at it because that's a, that's a way to quantify that somebody's eyes are on it. You know, now the hate mail comes via email. So if you run you know, controversial ads, you're going to get emails. At least uh, if you, you know, concentrate on the social media side of things, you'll understand immediately the impact that you're having. Make life fun. I mean, that's really, when you think about it, that's what we do. You know, we sell good times. You know, we, uh, we put smiles on people's faces. Uh, when you make somebody smile, you really you increase their quality of life. When you increase their quality of life, I think you create meaning for people. As a brand, once we create meaning, meaning, then I really think that uh, you've built a customer for life as long as you can continue to engage them. And that's really something that we stay focused on. Uh, it all begins in the hiring process, in my opinion. Uh, you only have to hire a couple of dipshits to uh, look back and realize that maybe you should take it a little more serious on the front side. We've learned that one the hard way a couple of times. So. Now we uh, definitely send people through uh, through the ringer before we bring them into our organization. Uh, when we started, skateboarding's always been fun. It's always been fun to me. But I think uh, skateboarding had lost some of its fun f for regular people. You know, people were hucking themselves down, you know, 15 foot, 
or uh, 15 stair sets. But the average guy's looking at that saying, I can't do that. And so what we tried to do was bring fun in skateboarding back to the masses. Uh, here we go. Adapt or die. Change is definitely one constant that we can all count on in this world. Uh, we have to stay in a constant state of innovation. Uh, the snowboard industry is always evolving. It's always changing. It has to. That's what, uh, that's what keeps the bottom feeders guessing. You know, the bottom feeders, I mean the guys that, uh, they don't spin, they're not up here riding. They're not this conference. They're sitting in their, no disrespect to China, but they're sitting in their manufacturing facility in China looking at the hard work of everybody else and saying, wow, all I, can, I can go buy one of those things and I can dupe that mold and copy that shape and alter it by 5%. I'm going to call it my own. That mentality kills me. But it, again, it, it's something that uh, it's here to stay. You know, there's some people that are in it for the right reasons, which is everybody in this room, and there's some people that are in it just to keep their factories open and, and, and keep the dollars coming in. Uh, so we need to continue to stay ahead of them all. I think complacency, in my opinion, that's for my competition. You know, it's easy to, I mean, for us, I'll say that we're on the top of our, of our market. It'd be easy to, to sit back and, and take it easy, but the reality is we got 300, literally 300 other companies coming after us today. Not after us, but after our market. There's only so many skateboards that can be sold out there. I've come to, uh, to understand that you know, before we would say, uh, you know, we started this thing. You know, you should only buy Sector 9. You should stick with us. We're, we're, we're the reason you're selling these things right now. But then I realized that that's a bunch of crap. You know, w moving forward, w we have to really reinvent. Uh, reinvent, that's kind of cheesy. But we have to retell our story every three to five years. You know, I mean, really, especially in the world of, uh, of the Internet, I think that we have to be really good storytellers to be good leading brands. And that's something that we really focus on at our company is how do we become the best storytellers. And that can be from, you know, uh, something as simple as this to, you know, a video that really tells the story of the brands that we're creating that we want to make sure that our customers see in the end instead of some kid on YouTube doing a board review for something that we made that totally sucks. So I think that Storytelling is incredibly Im important. Uh, the last one, um, you guys are almost almost done here, is uh, I think it's incredibly uh, important to lead by example. Uh, to me, that means build up other leaders within the organization. It means don't be a tool. It means uh, help the people around you become better at what they do. Not that uh, we profess to be the best at every job in our business, but I think it's important that we're the support system for the people around us to raise them up. This is uh, actually a photo of, uh, I, I set a goal for my company and said, hey, if we can reach this goal, I'll take all of you to Costa Rica. And we'll take it one step further, and if you each can choose, you know, I think it was three shops, and if they can reach this attainable goal, you can choose whichever shop gets closest to that goal and they can come with us and so this is this is all of us in Costa Rica uh, a few years ago it's a great trip some of the most profound advice that is that I've ever read uh, was be slow to speak and quick to listen and I think uh, you know as a leader as a guy that has you know 100 plus people working for me today uh, I think it's important to let the people around you do the talking and not uh, not be quick to have all of the answers, because sometimes I think the best answers are found from the people that bring you the questions. I try to raise the people up around me to, you know, bring me the uh, bring me the solutions, not just the problems. Anybody can walk into your office and say, "Hey, here's my problem." Uh, it takes somebody, it takes a real leader to walk in and say, "Here's the problem, and here's what I see as the solutions, whether or not they're right or not." Uh, be respectful and kind. 
Uh, I don't know if anybody, you know, I know some of you guys know some of the people that work for me. Um, we have an amazing group of people. Challenging to lead, I'll say. There's some uh, strong personalities. But, uh, you know, to gain their respect and to keep their respect, you got to give them respect in return. And so I think that's very important. And take out the trash, you know. Don't be too good to take out the trash. You know, uh, we have, well, we create a lot of trash. But every once in a while, I, I would challenge all of you to be the guy that walks around the office with a trash bag to take out the trash of the people around you. Because I think it says something that uh, there's no job too low and there's no jo job too high for, for you. So to end this thing, I, I, I'm going to end by telling you guys something that was told to me by a dear friend of my wife and, and mine. Uh, he's a pastor. And I'm only going to tell this story. I've only told it to a couple of people. But yesterday when I was on the bus, I'm thinking, okay, you know, how am I going to end this thing? Because what I was going to do was totally cheesy. Um, but everybody I've told it to, you know, it, it's had a profound impact on some people. And so my friend Jeff, he told me, and again, I'm, I, I, I travel a lot, like a lot of you. I'm, you know, uh, on the ride over here since we had some bus time and some restaurant time. Realize that um, most people have kids, uh, wives, and we're incredibly busy. And so the advice that he gave to me a year, I don't know, probably three or four years ago, which came at a great time as I was traveling a lot, and it's, uh, it was his glass bowl theory. And the theory is this, that, and this goes for men or women, it doesn't really matter, but as leaders or people that are busy and, and, and striving for success, when we leave the house, we basically we walk out the door and we hand, for me, I'll say my wife, this glass bowl, and we say, okay, honey, I'm going to go off. I'm the breadwinner. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go make it happen. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to bring home the bacon and you can fry it up in the pan. And the reality is, I mean, we have four kids, so she, her bowl's really heavy. But the reality is, no matter how many kids you have, the responsibility that you leave behind when you walk out the door, even though you do so with the very best of intentions, you hand the bowl and you say, you know, here you go, hold this, I'm going to be back, I'm going to go off, and I'm going to do our family right. And then you go away and you, 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 you work hard and you do great things for your family, for your wife, for your kids. But if you don't come back and take that bowl away every once in a while and hold it and take the pressure off, then eventually they're going to drop the bowl. And when they do, the bowl shatters into a million pieces. And at that point, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what you're doing, whatever feels important, you're going to drop whatever you're doing to go back and put the bowl back together. And so my advice as I close is hold the bowl. Don't let work become so important that you forget what really matters in life. And... Um, yeah, don't let the ball hit the ground. That's it. I'm done. You're not totally done yet. I just wanted to open up the floor for a few minutes. I'm sure people have some, some questions as well. I can just come around and, and move the mic. And as they think, they I just want to start with one. So much that we talked about was about you know, just persistence and sticking to your, your vision throughout all those hard years in the beginning, which is difficult enough to do for one person. But Sector 9 has a very distinct crew. You know, you guys have been in it from the beginning. A lot of the guys that were in that backyard are still in the company now. How was it to keep that vision among a group of people and, and keep them focused? And was it m more difficult than it would be to personal? Or how did you use to motivate everyone to keep them headed in the right direction? Well, it's not my vision. You know, it'd be one thing if it were me saying, hey, you guys, this is it. This is how we're going to do it. This is what we're trying to put out there to the world. But the reality is it's, we're, you're right, they have been there. I mean, I have, uh, I mean, I'm incredibly blessed. I mean, I have a solid, solid group of people. That's the only thing that allowed us to go against the grain was the strength of the people around me. Um, but it's, it's, it's our vision. It's not my vision. And so I think uh, as long as everybody has ownership in the vision, and they believe that it's as much their vision as it is your vision, 
then I think everybody stays centered around, you know, a common goal. And for us, it's, you know, living to be here tomorrow. You know, I mean, we, we love what we do and want to keep doing it. And so everybody, it doesn't feel, feel like work if you wake up and you look forward to doing what you're doing. And so as long as everybody shares the vision and they look forward to coming in and, and doing it, then it's, I think that's how we do it. I don't know if that answers the question or not. How did you come up with Sector 9, the name Sector 9? Well, that is a good question. Okay, so there's a couple of, there's probably 10 skateboards, 10, 10 boards that are out there that uh, do not say Sector 9. They are just an airbrush nine ball. And if you come across one of those, please let me know. Um, so our buddy who decided to move back to the islands, if you remember from earlier on, he was one of the first couple of skateboards that, uh, that Dennis helped make. Uh, he was from Hawaii, and he used to call everybody. He used to call everybody nine balls. Basically, it was uh, slang for people that were doing stupid shit. And so, the whole group started calling each other nine balls. And so, uh, the first few skateboards, probably ten or so, just had a nine ball on it. And one uh, one afternoon, we were at Dennis's house. And we were hanging out in his living room, and he checked his messages. And somebody had left a message on his answer machine that said, uh, what's going on over there at Sector 9? And he was like, hey, that's what we should call these boards we're making. And that's where Sector 9 came from. So we don't know who that guy was. We can't remember. But I'm sure he'll pop up someday wanting royalties or something. <laughs> Anyone? All right, well, thank you, Transworld. Thanks, everybody, for uh, the therapy session.